A very warm welcome to all our participants and resource persons to this second session of day two of the Asia Pacific Regional Training on Gender Equality and Human Rights. Namaste from India. As you all know, this three day online training program is being co organized by the Asia Pacific Resource, Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, Arrow as we call it, and CNS to help media and gender justice advocates strengthen their engagement around gender equality and human rights in the Asia Pacific region. Now, this particular session has been designed for the media and we have with us very eminent resource persons today to help us understand how media can play a vital role to advance gender equality and human rights in our region. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping announcements before we begin. Participants, please mute yourself while the speakers present and please keep, uh, you can type in your questions and comments in the chat box or raise your virtual hand if you wish to speak. And we need your support to make the session as interactive as possible. So please do not hesitate to clarify your doubts and share your comments and queries. Also, we are living in difficult times. So please pardon and bear with any technical glitches beyond our control that might arise due to poor internet connectivity. Uh, we will begin this day with some polls to recap day one. So please wait for the poll to appear on your screen. I hope you can see it on your screen. Is CEDA legally binding treaty? And you have a choice, yes or no? Get 30 seconds to answer. Goodness, yes, it's all 100%. Yes, Bobby, you can continue with. When was CEDA adopted? We have a mixed response here, 67% say it was adopted in the 1979 UN General Assembly. 33% in 1996 UN General Assembly. We'll get to the correct answer later. When was Generation Equality Forum held? 1996, 1979 or 2021? 100% go for 2021. Yes, now we can share the results. Okay, now, uh, before I invite our first speaker for today, let us create a Zoom storm. So I request each one of you, each participant, please type in the chat box one word that best describes your personality. And you have 30 seconds to do so and your time begins now. One word that best describes your personality. I want the chat box to be flooded. Wow. We have responses like moody, compassionate, happy, hmm, cute, loud, friendly, relaxed, nice, simple. Great, great responses. 
there should have been more responses it doesn't have to it is not a rain it has to be a storm okay i now welcome maitri porecha a noted firebrand journalist working with the ken maitri is an old friend and old means by way of time not by way of her age she will share her insights putting media under the gender lens over to you maitri a very good morning afternoon or an evening to everyone who's uh, joined us from around the world and thank you uh, shobha and bobby for having me here uh, i will um, keep my uh, talk short and uh, my my thoughts very very uh, limited uh, to uh, uh, you know a, a couple of minutes i am a healthcare journalist working out of uh, india and i have been working in india since the past uh, 12 years uh, i like to see when i put media under the gender lens i would like to see it in two ways one would be uh, the reporter themselves uh, and and how being a male or a female might you know kind of uh, affect the way uh, the reporter perceives their work and uh, secondly it would be uh, uh, it would be you know sort of reporting on the subject that you are and and how the gender lens affects the media therein uh, uh, starting with uh, uh, the reporter uh, i feel like the biggest uh, obstacle that that a female might face in uh, uh, you know starting their work in journalism would come from the family and uh, i'm i'm i mean it, i can at least speak for myself and uh, i can say that uh, so my family uh, uh, so i'm basically like a first generation uh, uh, earner uh, you know in in terms of uh, you know a woman earner in my family uh, none of uh, the people before me have uh, you know sort of uh, forayed out into work or have you know sort of um, Uh, you know gone out there and on money uh, and so the patriarchal norms in our uh, family were very very strong uh, I, i was never uh, stopped from um, you know going to school or college but uh, the real challenge uh, was uh, uh, you know uh, pr- probably started after college where um, you know they told me that you know you should get married at 19 and uh, so i staved off marriage for like five six years and i i told them that i want to get into journalism nobody understood uh, what it meant or uh, that it was not a 9 to 5 job uh, there were times when uh, i had to stay uh, late in office in order to edit uh, uh, and uh, uh, nobody really understood you know why i was staying uh, late or what my work demanded and uh, uh, i was actually asked to take up a 9 to 5 job in a company because uh, uh, you couldn't come come late at home uh so 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 that was like the first you know barrier to cross it eventually you know led me to move out of my house because it it became completely impossible to function in the house and also you know sort of work uh, uh so so those are the limitations so i i don't necessarily see any gender bias particularly in in in, in the newsroom in terms of employment because Uh, in in whichever places i have been employed um, it has it has not been male dominated in terms of numbers uh, it, it, the, the 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 participation of the females and the males has been equal uh, uh, you know in terms of numbers uh, however the second obstacle like you want to cross the obstacle at home the second obstacle that you face is at your workplace um, there had been and there have been multiple you know cases of sexual harassment that 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 have occurred in the in 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 our workplaces not necessarily with me only with me but also um, you know i have noticed this within my colleagues uh, so it was normal uh, uh, for you know like editors to ask interns out on you know out on a drink or uh, you know sort of uh, um, invite uh, them to to parties and then uh, uh, you know probably uh, you know sort of bully them or uh, you know it also uh, 
in, involves you know counting favors so for instance if you have won a fellowship on your own merit but uh, uh, you know and and you ask for you know uh, a recommendation letter uh, from your editor or you ask for uh, you know a letter to travel abroad a visa letter uh, i have faced instances where you know this has been held against me and uh, i have been told that uh, uh, uh you know uh, that i was done a favor to by the editor uh, uh that 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 you know he he gave me this letter so uh, uh so you know these kind of situations can always you know kind of put you in awkward positions where uh you sort of um, have to worry about the fact that you know your uh, if if you how you react in that situation might put your job on the line and uh, uh, there have been instances of um, a lot of women uh, quitting or putting down their papers because uh, you know this uh, this occurred um so <coughs> so this is what happens at the workplace and then there is uh, an entire um, field to navigate when you go out there to report uh, i remember a particular incidents where uh, uh, you know uh, me and one more female photographer were sent to uttar pradesh in order to uh, uh, you know cover the western uh, uh, up elections now uttar pradesh to put it in context is like the largest northern state in india and it is very notorious for uh, for its criminal activities um, so so when uh, when we were out there in the village um, late at night uh, Uh, there were some uh, political uh, uh, party workers uh, who who chased us and and who passed lewd comments they asked uh, uh, they asked our driver if uh, you know who are we where have we come from are we dancers uh, uh, and uh, and and so we had to so we 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 faced an a real risk of getting ambushed in the fields and and we had to quickly you know kind of pull ourselves out of that situation so uh, that 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 definitely led to us not completing our interviews on the field and uh, and when we came back to office our editor asked us uh, uh, you know where are those uh, where are those interviews and and we said that uh, we couldn't do it and then he shouted at us and he said that you no know, you you have to go and get them so fortunately we had those people's numbers so we could like do some kind of damage control but then how do you navigate a space where uh, you know uh, if 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 you've been ambushed or 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 you know you are being uh, you don't have enough protection that's why we felt that um, it's very important to have programs like for instance the culture in say bbc or uh, uh, you know uh, uh, an international wire agency would be very different where uh, they would have um, uh, uh, they would have security they would train the reporter on how to uh, uh, you know like kind of pull yourself out of the field uh, you know there would be an emergency number so if if you know you were in any kind of a problem you could just you know kind of somehow uh, raise an alarm and and there would be some kind of an evacuation mechanism uh, which completely lacks uh, in 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 the in the indian uh, media scenario uh, uh, so uh, so yeah i i just want to rest my case here with uh, three examples and uh, and this is and this is and what i'm saying is not anything new right i mean i'm sure that ev- everyone uh, especially uh, females have had to you know like traverse more obstacles whenever they have had to report and and that that's why it's very important to look at media from the gender lens right so yeah okay uh, uh, thank you matri and we already have a lot many questions and queries and uh, there is one question from uh, just a moment let me uh, we have a question from mensitemi from png that uh, you said the newsroom had females Uh, but what about decision making even if there were many females there was uh, the de- yeah. yeah so uh, right so uh, that's a good question uh, mentioned to me uh, uh, thank you for that uh, uh, so uh, yeah inevitably what happened was uh, uh, the uh, so so okay so in women for instance in leadership positions right in newsrooms so uh, i have worked across uh, multiple newsrooms in television and in in newspapers uh, the very first newsroom that i i worked in had uh, women in um, you know sort of managerial positions uh, these women were also reporting heads uh, they would uh, uh, you know in turn report to uh, the top bosses now the 
top bosses would largely be male but but they would uh, i mean these would be the top rung of editors so there would actually be like three or four hierarchies so there would be like these um so so i'll give you an example of cnbc tv 18 right where i where i worked first like that was my very first newsroom and uh that so it was a divide so it's it's not like females were not in decision making roles uh, that was not the case uh, uh that's not the case in indian media uh, there are women and there are women even uh, at the top um, that way i find uh, you know media to be a little more friendly than absolute corporate setups because uh, i read an oxfam report which had counted corporate setup harassments to women and in media at least i find journalists very vociferous i find journalists uh, you know speaking their mind out and therefore uh, you know even if we have to quit for instance we actually make our point and quit so it has it has never been that that we have been suppressed you know like women have not been suppressed uh, systematically in newsrooms that doesn't i mean that that is not been the my experience uh, at least or 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 experience of many of our friends right uh, yeah okay uh, there is a comment from nahid khalid from pakistan uh, nahid says that it is very different in pakistan as females do not outnumber men in newsrooms mostly decision making editor bosses marketing advertising top bosses executive board rooms they have all a predominant male dominance so nahid yeah you are you are absolutely right and i think that's the case in india as well um we often attribute the term malik or seth to uh, you know like uh, our top uh, sort of um, you know people who are owners of media houses now for instance uh, but however um, they have women as well so uh, for instance if you take hindustan times then one of the very influential owners is you know shobhana bhartia you know she is a female uh, however in z up till very lately uh, the top uh, the owner was subhash chandra agarwal he is a very noted uh, entrepreneur so so you know like we saw in newsrooms his daughter in law also coming in and then calling in the shots the but the problem here is not that they are male or female the problem here is that they are driven by a common um, you know sort of a goal of making money right uh, and and i have seen women at top positions also uh, you know especially if they are owners or they are in these executive board rooms uh, being extremely uh, driven by economical gains so so and and as journalists we are totally cut off from you know that uh, uh, level of ownership so so what 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 we end up doing is we end up bearing the brunt of it and doing what we are told to do in terms of you know how to churn out news right nahit so uh, i don't know if that answers your question but uh, but yeah you're right uh, we have uh, uh, dr ramesh chan shukla here uh, amongst the audience and he is uh, director at all india radio uh, lucknow uh, dr shukla would you share what is the ratio of uh, uh, male to female uh, 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 staff uh, all india uh, radio could you comment please please unmute yourself if you if you could listen to your comment no you are not all right meanwhile we have a question from uh, rita vidya dana she is a very senior journalist and former editor of jakarta post uh, from indonesia and she says matre you said there is no gender gap in your news organization in terms of number of male and female journalists but does that necessarily mean that the male have gender sensitive perspectives when deciding news and any decisions uh, so hi rita uh, 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 yeah so i'll give you an example of uh, uh mumbai mirror okay uh mumbai mirror uh, uh i don't know like just just does that name ring a bell uh, how many uh, people can say yes or no in the chat box uh, have you heard of this publication called uh, mumbai mirror 
yeah all right so uh, sumita says yes so mumbai mirror was uh, was i'm saying because uh, you know they have nearly discontinued now it's it's a publication of the times of india group which is one of the largest um, publications uh, in terms of uh, money and outreach uh, around the entire world and uh, uh, mumbai mirror was a, a city tabloid all right and uh, mumbai mirror was led by an editor named meenal baghel who was the um, editor in chief of this paper and that meant that uh, she was the one who was calling the shots okay so here is a woman calling the shots right uh, i'm just digressing a little bit and giving an example uh, to rita's question and then uh, uh, you know coming back to uh, uh, but that's because i want this conversation to be example led uh, so so there was a particular way in which mumbai mirror would cover uh, uh, violence against women uh, uh, you know uh, rape for instance and and the fact that they had to be sensational okay so this tabloid particularly what it did was it went ahead all right and published a photograph of a house where this minor was raped and uh, gave the name of the town along with a photograph of the house uh which made it very easy for the location where this victim stayed to be identifiable right and the editor was a woman okay so uh and i don't know if it was a slip up on on this woman editor side but she was questioned by us on how could you you know like be so insensitive in terms of this and 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 she had so much ego like you know she literally defended uh i i don't exactly remember what she said but but she spoke on both sides right so uh i i in my experience have found that it's not necessarily uh, uh you know males having gender insensitive uh, approaches uh, all the time uh but you know it's 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 rather more a dynamic where for instance an editor could be a female or a male a reporter could be a female or a male uh but what i mean to say is that it is a dynamic between a reporter and editor and if either of them is sensitive then you could save the publication but you know if if for instance they are not then what happens is that it's if if even if a male reporter is a male editor is insensitive it's my duty you know if i am a sensitive so so i don't necessarily see journalism with a gender bias but i see it more as a problem of training right so if 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 say it, it's a male editor or a female editor it's a male reporter or a female reporter but they are trained on how to report on for instance violence against women men you know like uh, uh, irrespective of the gender and how to portray it in the media i think that training is more lacking than males not having a gender sensitive perspective when they decide on news right Uh, or any decision because you know honestly a rape is a rape and it will if it will be featured on the front page it's just that how you feature it is 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 a problem that needs to be tackled editorially right okay thank you and we will digress a little bit from here because uh, the questions will continue comments will continue but uh, we have with us now judy sanderson editor at south african broadcasting corporation and a member of south african national editors uh, she has been in and out of uh, meetings so uh, we will uh, uh, i invite judy for her uh, presentation and then we continue with this dialogue and comments and questions welcome judy thank you so much i'm delighted to be here and well done for having such an important session Very briefly, I'll just give you a little bit of background from me of me and Sanif, and then highlight our glass ceiling surveys. Uh, one, both of which I've organ I arranged from one in two thousand six and the other ten to twelve years later on women in the media in South Africa. I uh, spent many years as a journalist and editor at the South African Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, often the first women in our newsroom and then the first women provincial editor responsible for news on radio zulu radio lotus and east coast radio so i i came across a lot of obstacles in my way and i wanted to make sure that women coming after me didn't have the same experience so i was a founding editor of the national editors forum in south africa 25 years ago 
And again, then there were very few women editors. Now I'm pleased to say far more. But a lot of the problems, uh, some of the challenges still remain. And we have new problems like cyberbullying, of course, that have come into play. So I was also, uh, as a gender activist, most of my life, I, I set up um, a rape crisis center about 35 years ago in the town of Peter Marisburg while I was still a reporter. And, and my sort of gender activism, initially separate from my media career, realized I had to do a lot more gender activism within media as well. So what I'd like to uh, tell you a bit about is some of the findings of our glass ceiling survey. Oh, that uh, comes out a bit back to front, sorry. <laughs> Uh, women in South African media houses. Um, some of the findings, sadly, were very similar to the one I organized in 2006, which was the first one we had, and we couldn't get any funding for it. So in the end, uh, myself and a, a fellow, a, an academic from uh, journalism school helped me design the questions, and we sent them to as many women journalists and uh, editors and men as well, and we circulated it. And unfortunately, a lot of the issues that came up then we're still finding in the survey that we did just two years ago. So, and of course, everything is exacerbated as you know, by shrinking newsrooms, shrinking budgets, uh, the onset of digital media and, 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 and still, and COVID, of course, the challenges around COVID. So I'll just highlight for you a, a couple of the things that came up and a couple of the recommendations from it. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I've got time till uh, just before 11. So uh, depending on your schedule as well. So what we have found, as the South African National Editors Forum, we were formed, uh, there was no proper organization. There was a Black Editors Forum, which I didn't really fit into. I was a bit too pale. And there was a conference of editors that was all male. So I didn't quite fit into that either. And then broadcast editors were also excluded at that time. So for the first time I felt I had a home, we launched South African National Editors Forum. Main aims to defend media freedom and to promote quality journalism. And from the start, I've been on the council for 25 years um, and in different positions, Secretary General, Chair of the Diversity Committee. And that is where um, I came up with the ideas to do a glass ceiling survey to find out exactly the extent of the problem and what could be done about it. Because women in newsrooms, there were more journalists coming in, but very few women editors and especially black women editors. So um, the survey we discovered in this latest one that yes, there are a few more women managers, but still um, it's not parity with men. There were um, the, the, almost as many female reporters as male reporters. And the, new, the survey we did went right across uh, community media, public broadcast media, commercial media, uh, radio, print, online, etc. So it was a nice uh, spread. We found that the, the gender payback, a uh, pay, uh, pay gap had actually widened across the spectrum. Um, that the policies in place, even if, if a, a, a company or newsroom had a gender policy, um, it was very limited. It didn't promote things like um, enabling um, women editors, for example, or women journalists, because, you know, we all used to go out middle of the night, you'd call any time you do a news story. Didn't help promote sharing of responsibilities in the home or co-parenting or anything like that. The one thing that hadn't changed at all, daily sexual harassment, sometimes from peers, sometimes from um, editors or managers, and also a lot in the field. And of course, exacerbating that huge uh, new area of uh, problem area of cyber bullying, cyber messaging, where women in particular have been targeted in the last few years, um, if they outspoken about exposing corruption or if they um, reporting on a rally, on a court case, or on a, anywhere basically that a woman is out reporting and someone doesn't want her to be there or doesn't like uh, what she's saying, um, she not only can get physical harassment, but also verbal and, you know, Twitter, horrible tweets. I mean, really nasty ones. Freyal Hefeji in particular had terrible, terrible uh, cyberbullying with uh, pictures of, uh, her face on, on, uh, on awful things. So Facebook, Twitter, I'm afraid, social media, absolute disaster in terms of uh, women journalists causing a lot of anxiety and stress to, to such an extent, actually, along with the COVID reporting that we at SANIF set up not only a media relief fund for journalists who lost their jobs, but an anxiety and stress line with the South African Anxiety and Depression Group 
we set up an SMS helpline, and that's been used a lot for all sorts of things in the last year. And then, so other, what we have found is some hope here, uh, young re female reporters becoming more assertive and asserting their rights more, but still discriminatory practices, structural inequalities, cultural factors, prejudices, sexism, et cetera. So what we're looking at, a few key recommendations like trying to encourage uh, and promote more ownership by women of media. It's quite difficult in the corporate world, but certainly community media, radio and, and newspapers and, and uh, uh, NGOs, it, it is possible to ensure that um, and help promote and we're providing guidance by giving draft policies, what we call gender and diversity policies, not just um, a, a kind of, uh, not just sexual harassment policies, for example, it, it, it's got to go wider into looking at career enhancement, training, access to training, a newsroom uh, climate to you know are they encouraging or discouraging etc um so really stamping out ways in which to stamp out the sexism the bullying and and giving women space to speak out and men, uh, monitoring and reporting the trends and and what is happening and obviously closing the wage gap so that, that that's um, a couple of the findings from the glass ceiling latest glass ceiling survey and some of the things that I found as a sort of pioneering editor where I had the first newsroom in the country that had a proper mix of our diverse newsroom. I made it a goal of mine to have almost equal male and female because when I came into the newsroom, uh, there was only me and, and, and then one other woman. And when um, as editor, um, I made my management team, I made sure we had Zulu speakers, we had South Africans, of, you know, Indian South Africans, half women, half men, as it were, in my uh, management team of, of, of nine, um, well, eight plus me, <laughs> so one extra woman, if you like. And uh, obviously in my newsroom too, to make sure I had a good mix of skills and life experience, because especially with our apartheid past, people had such different life experiences. And how can you have and uh, uh, enrich your newsroom uh, if, you, if you can't draw on all these different life experiences for your audience and properly reflect um, daily life and challenges um, that, that everybody has, not just sections of people. And that's another thing. Some of the tips I used to give, if you set up a panel um, of experts or do a box pops, always make sure you have a mix, male, female, young, old, rural and urban. Language must always be inclu inclusive, not and when you're editing, you make sure you don't use terms like fireman, but fight, a firefighter, for example. And then newsroom, I used to, I learned that from my um, gender activism uh, days, uh, rotate, if you have a staff meeting, rotate the chair so that men and women get a chance to chair and take minutes and, and encourage leadership, be flexible and ensure access to training courses, very important. Those are just some of the things. So let me stop there because I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Judy, thank you so much. And you have sort of uh, re-emphasized on what we strongly very believe in at, at CNS at least. And you were talking of that gender balance, which I find missing not only in media, but elsewhere also. And, uh, and we have to really force ourselves to think, as you said that uh, you're, even, you know, I have had, I have uh, be, uh, listened to webinars and uh, online discussions, say on International Women's Day and with ve very well-meaning people organizing it, but not a single female speaker there. Or, or, no, or, or, it's or, scary. Or, <laughs> yeah. It's so scary when people just don't yes. think. And also, yes. yes, you find you have to keep, reminding people because yes. they forget. Yes, we forget. And uh, very often they said, well, it was not our intention, but, but we couldn't oh. find one. But of course you'll find so many if you really look for them. So uh, I, I think that th those are very important points which you have raised. And uh, surely you must have uh, uh, brought about lot many changes. And now there must be more gender balance in the newsroom than what was there 25 years ago. Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. But then it has to be kept, you know, it, it can be eroded. You can have yes. a misogynist yes. editor yes. and it yes. could be eroded. So we have to keep a BDI on everything. Yes. Right, right. So that, uh, very good. And I think we have some questions there for you. I'll just uh, let right. me just check and then you will find out. 
yes avaki kutithamin she says uh, thank you matri and judy for sharing important insight Uh, judy thinks for mentioning race uh, thank you for mentioning racism and gender cross connection may i ask if racism is still uh, fueling gender inequality in south africa um yes in some in some instances it does and that's why in my survey i specifically asked what additional uh, obstacles if you like were uh, young black women experiencing and what we found too is that black men um i'm including black as indian colored and black if you like it, it's very difficult everyone has different ideas of how to group people we i try to get away from groups but you have to sometimes is is that they advance faster than women still in other words black men advance faster than black women in 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 their careers so there's still that kind of a more it's easier for men um the prevailing climate is still more patriarchal um and 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 race issues still uh, do crop up absolutely unfortunately and then some people who want to cause trouble deliberately uh, stir them up as if you, you don't have enough to deal with you know so you do get different agendas you get political agendas things that get a lot uh, politicized a lot and you have to really keep uh, keep keep a, keep 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 a close kind of make sure your vision and your path are very clear to everyone and that you don't take any nonsense and that you there to uh, ensure that every individual can fulfill their potential and that anyone who has additional obstacles we look at getting rid of those additional obstacles out of the way uh, sometimes racism sometimes sexism sometimes sometimes people for example transgender people there are all these issues d- disability yeah. anyone who's slightly different from the male norm basically that was in the past Uh, you always had a challenge to break through so now we have to make sure that it's not just gender actually it is diversity the people the, everyone must have an equal opportunity and we have to really level the playing field and it, it's taking i have to say the second glass ceiling i was a bit despondent at first because gosh i expected more to have changed um on the other hand it's good to see many feisty women and some men really pushing for change and making a difference so we try and hold up best practice and certainly i will uh, get the senate office uh, we will send uh, uh, um to to bobby uh, the the actual glass ceiling survey got a powerpoint on it we'll send that through to you so you can share it yes 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 in fact i think it could be on it's on our website actually so everyone can see uh, senf.org.za all our documents are there in fact there's a lot of stuff there Okay. Uh, so please have a look sanef you know www.sanef is a n e f .org.za okay okay thank you because i think this is very very insightful it will just help us and uh, i just wanted to share here quickly judy and others that uh, in uh, 2012 that's way back and we at cns we just uh, did a small try a, a small study Uh, not about uh, women being in the newsroom uh, but about how women were presented in the news published in the papers so uh, we did uh, a news monitoring of the first page of english newspapers chosen randomly from five south in uh, south asian countries uh, the times of india new delhi uh, the news uh, the news from islamabad pakistan new nation dhaka bangladesh kathmandu post and the daily mirror uh, from colombo and we had five indicators i'll just quickly go through the results we got it was uh, it uh, it was a very basic uh, sort of a survey you can call it or whatever uh, how many female journalists got news stories with their bylines on the front page of the english newspapers compared to the male counterparts uh, we had 30% for india Sri Lanka 15%, Pakistan 9.5%, Nepal 3.5% and Bangladesh 0%. Although there was a female who was leading the country who was at the head of the country but uh, that that was the then the second indicator was how many front page news headlines carried names of female newsmakers compared to those featuring male newspapers. Maximum in Bangladesh 22%, India 17%, Pakistan 16% Sri Lanka 15% and Nepal 0%. How many female experts were quoted in the news which were covered on the first page, uh, front page? 
women quoted as experts on front page news were maximum in sri lanka but that too was just 17% followed by bangladesh 15% india 12% pakistan 4% nepal 2% how many front page news content featured women compared to those that featured men in the news women mentioned by name maximum in sri lanka 44% india 20% Nepal six percent, Bangladesh twenty percent, Pakistan ten percent. How many photographs of women were there on front page compared to those of men? Sri Lanka thirty one percent, Bangladesh twenty three percent, India eighteen percent, Nepal seventeen percent, Pakistan ten percent. So that was wow. the front page coverage, which it was. Uh, I wouldn't call it a very very robust thing, but we just scanned the first page pages of these newspapers. Well, you know, I'm so glad you raised it because the reason I did the first glass ceiling survey in 2006, which was my, my uh, longtime friend, uh, Mary Papaya and I yeah. managed to persuade the um, mostly male editors of the National Editors Forum at the time to focus, have our AGM theme called Engendering the Media in 2003. And we had gender links, uh, an NGO presents and say only 17% of women are featured on average in our media. It was a horrific statistic. And most of the time as victims or as, 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 as prostitutes kind of, you know, the kind of two categories, either a murder victim or, or a sex worker. And, and, and my goodness, it was so, even the men were shocked. And that's how we got the impetus to really start doing a lot more what we call corrective action, uh, having a whole strategy from Sanef to take out into the newsroom to all the editors. Also uh, looking at news content, much more importantly, not just the news composition in terms of gender, but the content of what we're covering. So um, that has helped a lot. So these surveys giving the facts seem to help to touch a nerve for even some of the editors who weren't very interested. Um, because then they realize we say, look, you're missing more than half your audience. You're not serving them. You know, wake up. And this is money, too, in a commercial environment. Um, if you're not serving your audience, they'll go elsewhere. So it's a business decision, too, you know. So, yes, I'm glad you raised that. It's quite an eye opener. If you can get someone even a journalism school or some researchers to to do uh, just some some research, some surveys of how women are portrayed in the media, the images, the content like you've got. It, it helps, and then you have a seminar or a workshop or a conference. It raises the issue again, which we it seems we need to do all the time. <laughs> exactly. Uh, there is a question for both you and Matri, uh, Judy, that do male bosses feel threatened with your decision-making leadership? Oh, well, I, I've have had, <laughs> yes, I, I, a mix. I've had one or two have been good mentors. But when uh, Govan Reddy, who was our head of radio at SABC in 93, he asked me to go and head news um, uh, because my newsroom was the most transformed in the country just before our, our obviously big 1994 elections and, and, and 95 as well with local government. Um, anyway, when I was working in Johannesburg, first of all, um, uh, uh, some Australian editors were helping do some research about where the problems were in radio news and radio and how they could be fixed. Govan had um, invited them to come and look. And in, in the research, he'd interviewed some of the editors because they were mainly men. And some of them said, oh, I talk too much. Uh, <laughs> women editors talk too much. And uh, my first editor who appointed me, uh, to, uh, ironically, as the only woman reporter in the Durban newsroom at the time, said over his dead body, would there ever be a woman editor? And when I became acting editor in chief of all SABC radio news, when Govan appointed me for three months to, to um, fix the structures and, and change a whole lot of things, uh, make democratize if you like, um, and professionalize because it wasn't very professional. Well, um, he actually came and asked me for some freelance work. <laughs> I was really ironic. But, and, and then I, you get the sort of backhanded compliment, like um, um, when I was appointed, it was a, a, the, the male manager in KwaZulu Natal appointed me as the first woman editor in his uh, structure. And he said, basically he said, oh, I've got balls. Now that to him was a compliment. <laughs> I've got balls, a lot of them he didn't have balls. <laughs> I suppose because I was a fighter and I spoke up and everything, but, you know, so it's a mixed bag. <laughs> you get, you do, I've got resentment. I tell you what, from the white, the older white men in the newsroom when I was made editor, I could feel a lot of resentment until I really got going and, and tried to bring them along. 
but they were difficult. But when I went back to my small little office, I went from journalist to editor in quite a leap. Um, uh, I had a sign from my Zulu male colleagues who I'd worked side by side with. I'd, I'd, I'd organized charity campaigns for salaries. I had sued the SABC for an unfair labor practice because women and, and uh, men and women of color and women as well, all, all women, were discriminated against in the benefits. You didn't get the housing loan, uh, subsidy, etc. And I managed to win that. So I, they worked with me on, on campaigns as well for staff uh, equality. And I'd worked with them out in the field as reporters. Um, so I came to my door and there was a big sign that put up saying, Viva Iron Lady, okay. which I suppose whether you like Margaret Thatcher or not was a bit of a compliment at the time. <laughs> so yeah, a mixed bag. Okay, uh, Maitri, what are your thoughts on this? What would you like to share? Same uh, actually, I, think, I think Judy has uh, uh, put it rather succinctly and uh, she's, uh, you know, sort of, way more senior she's headed so many newsrooms so uh, so men getting threatened by 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 female presence there yeah it makes sense uh, in my case um, it's 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 mostly like i have had men who have been like rather senior to me but uh, but you know they have ended up telling me things like uh, so when i have demanded to know that you know why my story was killed or why was it not published what happened in backhanded ways um, one of my editors told me, um, why do you bother? You get your salary. And, uh, uh, and it was not necessarily a sexist taunt, but I mean, he could have said the same thing to anyone who stood up to him. Uh, uh, for, for us uh, as, as female or male reporters, it becomes very important to stand up to these people who then rather, you know, like suppress us as juniors and uh, show us the monetary argument and tell us to just shut up because we got our salaries. And, and I actually stood up back to him and I told him um, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, is an editor supposed to talk like that? Are you supposed to talk like that as an editor? Uh, then what is the difference between you and the marketing guy, you know? And, uh, and he was very, uh, he was very taken aback, um, you know, quiet. So since then, uh, there was this another case where uh, the same fellow uh, was was uh, you know sort of uh, asking my friend whether she he could drop her somewhere and uh, she sort of said that no but i'm waiting for my three so she was actually waiting for me and then he ended up calling me uh, you know a grandmother you know so he ended up uh, uh, telling her that uh, is she your grandmother you know, so there was this entire impression um, that these male editors would build of females, you know, who, who speak out, uh, or, you know, to be to something like Judy said, you know, the iron lady or, you know, someone having balls uh, or, 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 you know, like attributing it to a mother or, you know, those kind of um, sexist comments. So, uh, so that's something which is very easy for uh, male editors to make. And uh, it is something that uh, you know, like 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 females in the in the newsroom have to live with. Uh, there have also been uh, times when uh, you know just just in order to avoid the male gaze, uh, women in my newsroom have 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 dressed more conservatively when when they necessarily didn't have to, right? And so uh, uh, so you know if you'd been wearing like a short skirt or you've been wearing like a sleeveless top, you know, and and you find that that there are some threatening elements in the newsroom, then you know you and and this is happening in a city like Mumbai, which is so liberal with you know its culture and and you know people are like very very carefree there, and uh, and so I think threatening male elements in the newsroom can have like a lot of detrimental effects. Uh, in many ways, uh, uh, on on the culture of the newsroom, uh, uh, you know, especially editors who are not gender sensitive or female friendly. Yeah. yeah uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. But we have Rita Vidyadana from uh, uh, who was former editor of Jakarta Post from Indonesia. Rita, would you like to share your experience on this? Thank you so much. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Matri. This is. Uh, uh, what Judy said is like, uh, I experienced myself. I joined, uh, I joined the Jakarta Post early uh, in 19, uh, 1987, where the concept of gender was strange. And I, 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 I was just four of 50, four female journalists uh, out of 50 male journalists at that time. Uh, my 
my publication is English, uh, the one of the largest English daily in Indonesia. So um, at the time, a uh, female journalist uh, was rare and I was just four of them. So I was stationed uh, as a business reporter first and then city and national. So everybody, all the male uh, reporter and editor just look down on uh, uh, our capability as uh, female journalists to pursue our news. Um, but uh, I, 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 I never gave up hope and I never uh, succumbed to their uh, stereotyping. Uh, so at that time, I was, so, uh, I was regarded as a pushy, stubborn journalist uh, because I'm a woman. Uh, uh, at that time, I was uh, changed my position to become a features and Sunday editors. Uh, I don't. I didn't see it as a, a degrading my 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 positions, but I saw it as my uh, strong platform to promote uh, general quality in my. Uh, uh, I I I create a, a health and women issue uh, sectors and and in 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 my Sunday uh, edition. I push forward uh, news on uh, prominent women who have uh, who have uh, so many uh, accomplishment in in the society. So uh, I think I'm very happy now to see a lot a lot more of uh, young women editors and journalists. When I was uh, in the 19 uh, 80 and early 1990s, uh, when I, I got married at that time and then I, I was pregnant and then everybody called me a breastfeeding journalist with self sexist and I didn't care. Mm, but I pushed uh, my editors, my management to create a room for breastfeeding journalists. So this is, I think, uh, I don't see it as a, 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 a discouragement for me, but it's like fueling my uh, power to do more for women journalists in my uh, newsroom. So I think uh, the newsroom now is very, very uh, um, balanced uh, in terms of uh, the number of uh, women and male journalists as Maitri said. But in my time, uh, in my early time, it was so hard, like Judy said, that to get up uh, on a higher level without being stubborn, without being called stubborn or being called pushy. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see uh, so many fresh women journalists, so many uh, fresh executive in the media organization here in Indonesia. Uh, so I'm glad uh, I will, uh, uh, I'm, I'm part of this conversation now. Thank you so much, Soba. Thank you very much. And the conversation will continue uh, uh, with our next resource person, who is Kalpana Acharya, editor of Health TV Nepal. And she's also founding member of the Asia Pacific Media Network for Health and Development. Kalpana will speak on the role of media as one of the key cogs in the wheels for development, justice, and democracy. Over to you, Kalpana. Thank you. Thank you, Sabaji. Thank you so much uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share my ideas here in important session. Hi, everyone. Uh, namaste and greetings from Nepal. I am Kalpana, uh, especially health journalist. I'm doing um, health journalism since 15 years. Uh, I'm the past president of Health Journalist Forum Nepal. Uh, this is the national network of health journalists here in Nepal. And I also teach uh, mass communication and journalism uh, subject in bachelor's level uh, here in Nepal. Uh, through this session, I just uh, want to share my uh, ideas, uh, what is the role of media uh, for the development of democracy uh, and the gender equality.
Okay. Uh, can you share? Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, um, through this session, uh, briefly, um, we suppose that media is the mirror of the society, and media can play a um, great role to change the uh, society in various ways. Uh, that's why a media plays a very significant role in keeping everyone updated about the various events around the world. Today, we can check out the latest news and current affairs with just a few clicks of mouse. Uh, we simply say that a vast majority of people, even now also all across the world, uh, depend on various sources of media for keeping themselves updated and various ongoing issues around the world. Uh, media plays an important role for the whole society. We know that uh, media also play a very important role in the building of a society and development justice and democracy, which I uh, want to discuss today. In today's world, uh, media has become almost as necessary as food. Uh, so it is mirror of the society and plays an outstanding role in the strengthening it. Uh, yeah, um, when we talk about the uh, how media can play uh, for the um, uh, development justice and gender equality, uh, it gives us uh, immense knowledge and transmit information. Uh, this is the role of media. Media keeps us informed about various happening around the world. It uh, lets us know what is happening around us and all over the world. With the help of media, we get immense knowledge on various subjects. It updates information from time to time so that the general public stay aware, stay aware of what is going on in the country and the entire world. This is the information role of mass media. This is very strongest role of mass media, we say. And number two is raises our consciousness. Media raises awareness by providing information and knowledge. In media not only give the information, important information, it advocates uh, the issues. It does not enforce its own opinion uh, on us, uh, but provides facts, figures, and news to us so that we can analyze the information and can understand what is wrong and what is right. Uh, it gives the shape of opinion to the audiences. Number third is uh, media raises voice against issues in societies. We know that media also plays a constructive role for the society by raising the awareness of issues. There are many examples of social issues like gender equality, gender rights, SRHR, sexual and reproductive health rights, human rights, etc. we say. Uh, that have been raised by media when media presents and unveils such issues the public becomes aware and the necessary steps are taken for revolving the these types of issues and problems so uh, media have many roles now we can discuss on that next please Uh, number four is, uh, we simply say, provide uh, media provides true pictures and live telecast. Uh, any live event happening right now can be watched everywhere. This is the information is today. For example, conferences, uh, we are doing this session. This is also live. A political address by a PM uh, or leaders live coverage of areas affected by flooding, or just any other incident, media helps us see the exact picture by providing the live recorded telecast uh, through the pictures, through the photos, illustrations for almost all important events. Number five is uh, educates the society. When we talk about the role of the media, it not only uh, inform and um, give the awareness, it also educates the society directly and indirectly. One of the most important role of the media is to educate the society. We can 
explore and analyze various products, reviews, do price comparison for various items, read news about politics, fashion, war, weather, health, and much more, right? Uh, with the help of media. So uh, media exposes issues like poverty, illiteracy, social backwardness, and uh, lots of issues through media can educate the society. It also educates people about their rights and duties and helps enforce law as well. When we talk about the role of education, we simply say, um, uh, talking about the Nepal situation, uh, we have a geographically a very difficult country. That's why uh, through the distance education, through the telecommunication, um, they can get and um, um, you know, informal education, distance education through the television, radio. So um, media uh, not only informs the public, not, one, not only aware, the public, not only the advocacy role, media directly and indirectly educates the society too. Next, please. Uh, when we talk about the uh, functions of media, roles of media, um, we should be responsible. We media persons should be responsible. Media, not only uh, the free, uh, we suppose free media, but media, uh, not only the free, there should be journalists should be responsible and accountable, uh, whatever they uh, do. A free media functions as a watchdog that can investigate and report on government wrongdoings. Yes, um, uh, this, that's why this is called watchdog of the society and watchdog of the nation. A free and objective media is an essential component of any democratic society. Uh, we believe in that. That's why um, media are the pillars of the democratic society. For that, we should have uh, three um, major um, areas are here. Uh, I want to uh, highlight state obligations toward the free and independent media, number one. Number two, enabling environment for journalists to advocate development and justice. And number third is adherence to media ethics responsibility and accountability in doing justice to our roles. So uh, media um, must have uh, the responsible role too. Uh, we have uh, lots of medias like social medias and other kinds of uh, media tools to communicate, but uh, we should uh, differentiate between social media and the uh, mainstreaming media. We have to differentiate it um, if we differentiate uh, these two types of media, then we can uh, choose which one is right and which one is wrong. Next, please. Uh, uh, talking about the responsible and free media, states and governments have responsibility to protect free media. Democratic states do that even by encouraging media to criticize their works so to have balance of power among executive, legislative, and judiciary. Media is known as the fourth state. Uh, it is supposed only, it is not by the law. Media is only at the fourth state because of its role only to watch upon organs of democratic state. It is high time that media checks and balance power, watches on wrongdoings of the power centers. And at the top that, states should encourage media to show them right way towards fulfilling obligation laden citizens. So governments also have some responsibility to strengthen the media. Number two is mass media is considered as the voice of voiceless people. Uh, if there is uh, some problems of um, uh, voiceless people, media uh, may be the voice of that uh, kind of people. Uh, this tunes well in advocating and protecting rights of individuals without fear and favor. Hence, journalists need to know about uh, the country's obligations towards citizens' rights, also to check whether governments abide by their commitment to protecting human rights, mainstreaming deprived people to, people to the process development. So mass media should know the 
uh, countries, rules and regulations and uh, treaties and um, what type of sign a government uh, done and did earlier. Uh, next, please. And uh, number the third is um, Article 19 of the International uh, Convenient on Civil and Political Rights states the right to freedom of speech that everyone shall have the right to hold opinions without interference and freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas, all kinds, regardless of front eyes, either verbally in writing or in a print in the form of art or through any other media of his or her their choice. So media should watch on governments, whether they have ratified this and similar treaties introduce law according to international commitment. What is your country's um, treaties and what they signed? Uh, media should watch and ratify uh, that type of um, uh, treaties and laws. Uh, next, please. And um, we know that journalism is a profession um, guided by the ethics. Uh, there should be uh, ethical journalism uh, for the democracy and strengthen the gender equality and gender justice and other kind of justice. Adherence to media ethics, responsibility and accountability in doing justice to our roles is key to ensuring human rights and inclusive participation. So I think all should, uh, all journalists should go through code of ethics prepared and enforced by professional associations or press councils and or similar organizations. The fundamental and universal principles within any code of ethics fall on, uh, we simply say in journalism, ABC, accuracy, balance, and credibility, do no harm principles, defending freedom of information, comment and criticism, uh, reporting facts without distortion. Um, in some cases, we see distortion uh, and uh, some defamations and other kinds of information, misinformation and disinformation. Uh, staying away from a plagiarism, defamation and unfounded accusations. And extra attention towards gender identity, gender role, disability, minors, and children. So these are the uh, professional ethics guided by the um, ethics and code of conduct. Um, all journalists should follow these types of uh, ethics and code of conduct for the ethical and responsible journalism. Uh, next, please. Uh, okay, I uh, want to share this uh, infodemic. Um, uh, here is not only um, pandemic, here is also information pandemic problems also occur in uh, all over the world, not in uh, only in Nepal. Uh, information plus pandemic um, is called infodemic. Uh, it means uh, this type of situation in which a lot of false information is being spread in a way that may be harmful for us. In COVID-19 uh, um, uh, pandemic, uh, we have faced infodemic problems. Um, we should be careful, especially we journalists, which one is right and which information is wrong. Because uh, we, if we journalists share uh, through the social site and social media, it may be wrong. Uh, that's why we should verify the right sources and right quotes, uh, how much of this information is accurate. We should be assured that before uh, sharing um, because social media's followers and um, um, uh, social media users uh, can share the information, but journalists should think about uh, it uh, before the sharing. Uh, it, it, uh, if it um, publish, if it once publish, it, is, um, it reaches to thousands of people. That's why we should be careful and it should be responsible for the uh, wrong information and right information. Next, please. 
uh, okay, this is my um, last slide. To promote credible journalism, uh, one must uh, adhere to ethical standards and promote strong norms and professional journalism. If we uh, simply say journalism um, uh, must follow the basic principles and uh, journalism must follow the uh, laws guided, uh, um, issued by the uh, press council and um, other organizations, improve competence and digital literacy. <clears throat> um, uh, we should uh, competent in digital, this is the information age, uh, this is the technology age, that's why we should be familiar. Uh, this is um, the basic uh, knowledge and skill and expose disinformation campaigns. Um, we S uh, simply um, see lots of informations, disinformations and misinformations are occur in this pandemic situation. Um, as I all earlier mentioned that infodemic, that's why expose disinformation uh, campaigns. This system uh, manipulation, we should not manipulate the information data and other things. Um, that's why uh, we uh, want not only uh, free media, uh, but accountable, credible, and responsible media should be there. Um, saying this, um, we all journalists should be responsible. Not only we not only talk about the freedom, uh, we should be accountable, credible, responsible for gender equality, gender justice, development justice, and all. Um, saying this, uh, I want to stop here. Thank you again to organization, organizers, uh, Bobbiji, Sabaji, and all participants. Thank you. If there is any query, I would like to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kalpana. Thank you for just reiterating and reminding us what is what should be the role of the media. We have a few questions for you, Kalpana. Uh, Waki. Koti Thani from Thailand wants to know that as a senior media editor, did you face any challenge in your journey because of being a woman? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Yes, um, my earlier uh, friends discussed on that. Uh, being a woman journalist, we have lots of challenges. Uh, I started my career uh, 20 years ago as a radio journalist. Uh, at that time, uh, almost uh, there are, this is the uh, government-owned media, uh, radio, uh, this is called uh, Radio Nepal. And um, we have uh, 24 um, staffs, journalists in whole newsroom. Uh, only one woman, that is me, that was me, okay? So at that time, um, women's participations and engagements were uh, very less. Uh, that's why uh, when uh, we simply uh, example, we don't have um, don't have even now also some media houses don't have separate toilets. You know, now um, we have to go. Uh, in same toilet uh, which are used by men. So this is the small, small uh, uh, challenge we faced. When um, uh, talk about the opportunity, when uh, some opportunities uh, come and then uh, name come to uh, males, male journalist. So uh, she is a woman and she can't do this. and. Uh, she has family, she has um, to go home earlier. That's why uh, don't give this responsibility uh, to uh, female journalists. This guys, this kind of um, challenges faced a lot in my career. Even now also we have um, facing lots of challenges and we are struggling, but um, I did not give up uh, my um, passion and now I'm here. Okay, thank you. Uh, another thank you. Que uh, a question from uh, uh, yeah. Mendicinimi from PNG that make, uh, big media corporations uh, are, and social media corporations are not letting media follow ethics as profit takes primacy over ethics. Uh, is it true in Nepal? 
and nahid also wants to know that uh, as uh, uh, is the media free in nepal and how much of interference is there from the government uh thank you thank you for the questions yes um, now media is the uh, media is free to um, uh, communicate disseminate any kind of information it's because uh, this is the democratic country um, but yes uh, some obstacles from the um, power centers and some um, um, mafia groups and other groups, pressure groups, we simply say pressure groups, um, uh, have uh, some, sometimes um, there is obstacles. Otherwise, media is free. Uh, another question is social media and um, mainstream media is def uh, definitely, there are vast differences between social media and uh, mainstreaming media. Social media, I, I simply say, uh, social media is 2D can, this is, um, uh, in our Nepal, we have um, um, large um, land, which is called Tudikel. Um, this is Tudikel. Whoever can come and they can um, deliver their speech, they can um, express their views. But uh, media house and journalists are, are different. We have some obligations and we have some ethics. We have some um, code of conducts. We should have followed that code of conduct and ethics to um, deliver and to disseminate our informations because we have a responsibility towards the citizens. Uh, we have a freedom of expression. Um, um, we have rights, but we have bounded by the some code of ethics. That's why uh, social media and social media users and media um, professionals and journalists are different they should be more professional and more accountable and more responsible okay Th thank you very much kalpana and as i said the conversation continues it yes. does not end here Shiva, so, thank sorry. you yes sorry there is okay bobby yes bobby's hand is raised yes bobby. yes sorry sorry just wanted to say uh, because we have kalpana right now on the stage so we just wanted to hear from her because kalpana acharya has led from the front in terms of uh, uh, media person in uh, helping uh, ensure that Nepal uh, stands true with its obligation for tobacco control. And uh, there was there, there are many instances where she has played important role in ensuring that media holds the government to account because government has to implement tobacco control, not tobacco, tobacco industry efforts. So even during COVID, industry tried to do something and you all uh, mobilized everyone, you, all the civil society and media came together. And Kalpana, can you share? Because that is a very positive example how uh, media organizations are uh, playing a very important role in not only holding government to account, but also saving people's lives because of tobacco, uh, from tobacco hazards. So over to you. Yes, uh, yes, Babiji, um, um, I, I have a wonderful experience uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, yes, uh, Nepal is the first country to implement the 90% uh, pictorial health warning signage. But unfortunately, um, I think now Nepal is second, third uh, in list uh, because of the government's uh, negligence. Um, um, in COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic time, uh, the tobacco industries, which is very biggest industry in Nepal, Shure Tobacco, um, uh, tried to, um, what to, uh, what to say, try to um, leaders uh, use uh, in their campaign. And um, they tried to give, not only tried, they already uh, given, uh, so seven provinces um, uh, ministers, they gave five crores per province uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, patients or whatever uh, management. Mm, but um, in that time, a media persons, we journalists um, unite, uh, united together and we campaign, uh, this is, uh, uh, the against the law, uh, tobacco industries cannot give and uh, support the government to um, any kind of activities uh, through the uh, tobacco taxes 
money. That's why uh, we tried to uh, back that money and uh, we uh, uh, wrote lots of stories against them and uh, government also uh, felt that and governments um, uh, uh, taken this step backward. So um, um, in Nepal's um, tobacco companies interference are uh, very high because of the leadership. Uh, but uh, media's role is very important to implement the law. Uh, even we are fighting uh, to implement 90% pictorial health warning must be there uh, because um, this case is on the court. That's why we are not doing anything. Uh, otherwise, uh, we are still fighting Babiji. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that was a big victory for uh, at least giving one kick out to the big tobacco industry. By yeah. Putting, by uh, yes. Another, yes. Another is uh, our uh, medical council president uh, tried to uh, receive five crore rupees from the tobacco industries, but um, we uh, convinced him and we uh, write up lots of articles against him and tobacco industries. That's why he rejected to receive the, that token of money. Okay, great. A big clap for <laughs> the journalist thank from you, Nepal. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I now invite Rita Vidyadana. As I have earlier mentioned, she's a very senior columnist and former editor of Jakarta Post. Welcome, Rita. And please share your thoughts on why media should think gender. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Bobby, could you, uh, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, Soba and Bobby, for allowing me to share with our friends here across the Asia and the Pacific. So um, I, I would like to thank uh, everybody um, for uh, doing a great job like Kalpana, Maitri, Judy and others, and I'm sure uh, everybody here uh, have their own story. So I think I I would not uh, uh, go through all my uh, presentation because I so well, may I uh, just invite uh, I I just go through a part of my presentation and invite uh, all of my friends here to share their experience uh, because I really want this is a, a rare opportunity to be able to come together. So I really want to hear uh, what is going on from PNG, from uh, Bangladesh, from uh, Thailand, from uh, uh, India, of course, uh, and from other country uh, to share their experience and to, to, to have a, a heated conversation on, on this issue. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, my point here is uh, I want to uh, share with you is uh, under the theme, be the change and why think genders. Uh, we are a game changers. We have the power to influence others. And we had oh, long before uh, uh, social media influencers, we are a great influencers, I think, uh, uh, as a journalist, because we have the power to influence other, we have the power to change people's perception on certain issue, certain uh, issue. So as a journalist and writers, by being gender sensitive, we can improve our journalistic and literary works, as well as uh, the, right, the direction we take. Uh, next, Bobby. Okay, why should I ever mention gender? Kalpana and other speakers have already uh, described why should we uh, think about gender, uh, how the media uh, should adopt gender uh, equality, uh, gender uh, freedom, uh, gender balance, and so forth, because gender equality is uh, an integral part of our freedom of expression. As a gender category, have the rights to be heard and to be seen in the public sphere as full-fledged citizen participating in a democratic society. And therefore, gender ba balance 
is important in our news reporting and writing. Equally important is the need to challenge the prevailing gender stereotypes. This is very uh, uh, important because live, we live mostly we live in the uh, uh, in the Asia and the Pacific region under strong patriarchy uh, culture, where stereotypes prevailing in every aspect of our life. So, this is uh, as a journalist and writers, we were to recognize the diversity of race, ethnicity, religion, sex, ability, age, and class. So our work will sell, will strive to eliminate discrimination of this basis of gender from their perspective, perspective publication and pledge mm -hmm. to put more effort to provide more balance, fairness and accuracy in our reports. So we have to be inclusive by seeking a diversity of voices rather than really solely on use, uh, unusual make dominant sources. Bobby, so gender, greater gender awareness means better journalism and writing. Because we are journalists and writers, we work with words and concept. Words is our weapons. Word is our tool. Uh, words and concept are the production tools of journalism, journalists and writers. By applying concept and words, we execute our responsibility to the public and individuals by ensuring their right to information, which is a fundamental right that contributes to the well-being of the society. So when we increase our knowledge and use of words and concept, we achieve greater awareness. Our awareness leads to sensitivity, which will bring a new and fresh perspective at any subject matter we write. Citing example, if we are aware of the needs of people with disabilities, people living with HIV AIDS and, and HIV AIDS and others, we can write news and writing pieces on the subject and by raising awareness of the public on this issue. And therefore we can contribute to paving the way for improving condition and for better policies and legislation. Gender issue can be found in both conventional and new areas of journalism and writing. Stories about the effect of climate change on people, especially women and children. Stories on how COVID-19 pandemic affecting people, as well as stories on how the present global health system fail us are among the most read and most watched news. So gender concepts are found in all aspects of our life, including journalism, good governance, health system, education, economic, political sectors. So when, we, when the concept of gender is fully understood by us as a journalist, society will become healthier and more equal. But can we really achieve this? Yes, I'm emphasizing of language in our works because language is a reflection of the attitude behavior within our social society. It also shape people's attitude. So our words, our writing is very important. As a journalist, writers, as well as gender advocates, policymakers, and the broader public, we are expecting to use gender sensitive language in our communication. So I think uh, I have to stop here because we can start uh, opening uh, our open discussion by sharing your experience, how you uh, challenge the stereotypes in your organization in every country and how can we uh, eliminate any stereotypes? So I think uh, it is very important for us to learn from each other and to uh, bet build better uh, media landscape in the Asia Pacific, Pacific region in particular. So
so uh, the discussion by maybe sharing uh, experience uh, by uh, our participants here, uh, especially from uh, Ferris Khan, so and Bobby. Uh, for other uh, material, uh, you can you can read in uh, my presentation. But the most important thing is uh, we have live discussion. Uh, we have a uh, 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 insightful discussion uh, among each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rita, for uh, again stirring the conversation once again. Uh, there is a question for you from Asma Akhtar. Uh, how can we include gender equality in media ethics? And uh, how can we inculcate it in media ethics? The concept of gender equality. Thank you for the question. This is very important because gender equality is a, a really uh, a human rights. Uh, is, uh, we, we have to include every gender perspective in our newsroom, our ethical as a journalist, we see how uh, 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 a gender is uh, manifested in our works. Is that Hello. Yes, 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 I can hear you. Yes. And uh, there is a question from uh, uh, just a moment. There is a question from uh, uh, Vakuki from uh, Thailand. And she wants to know, what do you mean by gender sensitive language? Uh, can you give some examples of gender sensitive and compared to gender insensitive language? Oh, okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Vakuki from Thailand. Uh, I think we have a uh, uh, very uh, many many phrases in our local language that is gender insensitive, uh, but gender sensitive language is gender equality made manifest through our language. Gender equality in language, men and those who do not come from the binary gender system are addressed to language as person of who. So I think like uh, I can, I can, I can uh, 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 give you an example. Like people always refer that uh, the company directors is always male and secretary is always uh, 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 a women, a girls. Uh, pilots is al pilot is always a uh, uh, man and flight attendant is always women. So there are many, many, like, you don't cry like a girl, that is insensitive gender uh, language. Uh, and then uh, you, you walk like a woman, means that you work like a, a lady when you refer to a man who, who is so, uh, 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 referring to a man, weak man, so you work like a woman. So woman here is referred as a weak person, weak individual. That is gender insensitive language. And we, we always hear every day in our life, like uh, don't throw a, a stone like a, like a girl, don't cry like a girl. It's just gender insensitive language. And we, uh, as a journalist, we have to avoid that kind of insensitive language, Spikey. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rita, there is a request from Nahid Khalid. Yeah. And she, she says that uh, in her long experience of lifetime as breaking glass ceiling and surviving and thriving as media in Indonesia, can Rita please share some tips for female media to not lose hope and keep on going? Oh, yes, of course, yes. Uh, thank you, Nahid. Uh, for your question. This is uh, uh, very true to me and I hope also very true to our uh, colleagues uh, also. Uh, because uh, we as uh, women journalists have to work harder in Indonesia, harder than our male colleagues. And we have to equip with knowledge every day, every day. So we have to be able to, 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 
to uh, stand equally with them. So it's, it's very challenging for us also to prove ourselves. We have to prove our uh, accomplishment. We have to prove our achievement, uh, but don't give up. Uh, now, uh, I am here now after 35 uh, years in journalism, and I'm very proud to be uh, able to continue forging uh, for uh, women, gender equality in the newsroom, uh, for women journalists to train women journalists in Indonesia to be able to, uh, to, uh, to have uh, their capacity uh, improve so they can uh, be proud of themselves and never give up because uh, we are women have the capability, have the capacity, uh, same uh, opportunity to be able to, to, to equally respect it as accomplished journalists. So I think uh, don't give up on, uh, on that. And, but also don't forget to also to keep improving your capacity as a journalist, as a writer, as an editor, as an advocate, as a general advocate, and so forth. So I'm very proud uh, to see so many uh, Indonesian female journalists now, uh, are now being able to uh, stand up uh, for their uh, passion as a journalist. Thank you, Nahid. Yes. Thank you. And we are all together in this with you, Rita and Nahid. Uh, to just advance this still more, and we can do it together. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly, Soba. Like yes. Soba, you are great. At no, 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 thank you, thank you. Uh, now, uh, we are actually running short of time. Yeah. So I, I would now request Bobby Ramakan to please tell uh, us something about audio transcription and basic tips for photos and videos. And thank you, Bobby, for filling up at the last moment for Nurul uh, Islam Hasif from Bangladesh, who could not, uh, he, he works at Bangladesh Post, he could not make it at the last time. So over to you, Bobby. Yeah, um, actually, uh, we will request Doc Thieu, if possible. If uh, Doc Thieu, will you like to uh, uh, share tips or? Is this internet connection stable and okay? I don't know. Hi. Yes. Hi. Uh, do you mean me? Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Yes. Yes. Uh, gender sensitive language is a problem also in Nema. Once uh, I wrote an article about uh, uh about their uh, gender identity, that is about their LGBTQ. But the editor from the uh, my, my uh, printing house cut off these words because uh, he think th these are very sensitive. Also, just. They think this is taboo. Uh, so the gender sensitive language is also uh, very uh... You are muted, I think, Doctor, you muted yourself. We can't hear you. Hi, Mike. Yes. Which is very bad. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank. Thank you for that uh, interjection. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Please complete. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, LGB, thank you. Thank you. Gender sensitive. Uh, can you answer, sir? Uh, gender sensitive language. It, is also a problem in Myanmar. The editors and the most of uh, journalists do not agree to describe about the, the us because 
these are very sensitive to our people. Uh, they think these are just taboo. Taboo. <laughs> very well. Okay. Okay. Th thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank yes, you so sorry. much, Doctor. And uh, this was do uh, Dr. Tin Wang uh, Thieu. Uh, he is the editor in chief of uh, Health Digest Journal in Myanmar and also writes for the Standard newspaper in Burmese and uh, also did a very important show on uh, Voice of America Burmese uh, in these difficult times on antimicrobial resistance as week of um, the uh, raise awareness about antimicrobial resist uh, awareness is going on currently. So thanks a lot, Doc Theo. Uh, for your leadership uh, over so many decades. So thank you. Uh, so friends, uh, they're very, uh, I don't, uh, this is a very esteemed audience of such a senior people here. I don't need to say much, but this is, they just wanted to, uh, you know, share this story because I read this, uh, I, I, my first exposure to this story was in late nineties uh, that our father and son Dio met an accident the father was not hurt much, but the son suffered head injuries. The father rushed the son to the neurosurgery hospital. The neurosurgeon examined the child and said to the father that, I'm sorry, I cannot operate on this child because this is my child. So who is the neurosurgeon? What is the relationship of the neurosurgeon to the child? Come on, type it in the chat box. A good one, Bobby. Come on, type in the chat box. Who is the neurosurgeon to the child? Why can't neurosurgeon yeah. operate on this child? <laughs> We've got yes, an answer. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Fatou. <laughs> Thank you, Rashmi. Thank you. Yes, right. absolutely. And you know, in early 90s, I could not, uh, I could not figure it out. I, I was actually bald for a few seconds, maybe minutes, I don't really remember. But this was a very life changing story for me personally, in this journey of unlearning so many gender stereotypes, which, you know, seep in through or which we grew up with. And uh, uh, especially in our own local settings, context, um, uh, things. So anyways, coming coming uh, in interest of time, uh, Shobha has only asked me to talk about this. So trans in transcription, I think the most important thing for what, what we have learned is that, um, you know, uh, we, should we should not do sketchy transcription. Uh, it should be accurate. If we are ever in doubt, always check with the with the person, um, uh, for especially for the inaudible part or difficult to hear part. Uh, it's focused work, so stay fresh because uh, it could be half an hour interview, it could be longer, it could be even longer sessions, as we all know. Um, I do, uh, and this is on in the manual I am talking, uh, which was launched yesterday. It is page sixty. And about photography, actually, I, we, we have no experience of professional photography. We only have experience of using very simple cameras. Uh, now, in current context, mobile phone cameras for all the kind of work which we do. So, uh, and now there's no need to have those uh, digital cameras for us. So, uh, so all our tips and uh, are basically meant for from that perspective. And this is not a professional uh, thing and probably Doc Thieu or Kalpana uh, will be better uh, guide uh, in in this in this direction. Uh, so this is also in, on on the on this uh, page. So, uh, but most important for me is that we should ask permission where relevant and uh, if possible use a consent form. This is very very important, especially when we are interviewing uh, persons with, uh, for example, uh, tuberculosis, gender violence survivors or uh, uh, girls and women and uh, boys and LGBTQIA P plus population, people who get trafficked, uh, who just very recently, um, uh, just very recently, actually two weeks ago, I was uh, asked by an activist here to record a video using my mobile uh, at the last minute, uh, just to capture the testimony of, uh, of, of, of two women whom, whom we happen to know. One was gang raped 
and one was traffic to mumbai and then uh, somehow luckily uh, reached back home and was trying to raise resources so that she can open a uh, some cloth a business in um, in uh, where we live so uh, in that same locality so uh, uh, so those two videos were taken and then activists wanted us to share it along widely and i was like have you taken consent did you did we tell them that we are going to sh share your video publicly and the, you know when we checked with those women they did not want the video to go out of course and in gang rape case there are legal there are laws where we cannot reveal the identity of the survivor and there are other obligations which we have so these are just very small example but there are so many more very this is a small but very very important example and but there are so many more such uh, now cases you know when we are especially when we talk of gender equality so consent form is very important people should know and there are ways where we can uh, depict a uh, similar thing and most important session is actually tomorrow where we will talk about how should we use very very simple tools in very emergency or crisis situations including uh, sexual and gender based violence to document and um, uh, more and more evidence um, uh, form so shobha back to you for this okay thank you very much bobby and in fact we have already overshot the time by 25 minutes or so so with this we come to the end of the second day of the asia pacific regional training program on gender equality and human rights Uh, my sincere thanks to all the resource persons and participants for being with us here today and enriching the session with their thought provoking inputs and as i said the conversation can go on and on and should go on because only then we will be able to forge out and think out new ways and new methods and also reiterate what what needs to be done to have gender equality and uh, bobby just now mentioned the word survivor and we were talking of gender sensitive language earlier so most often than not un unknowingly we use the word victim i think every woman is a survivor and if, if we talk of a victim of rape a victim of sexual abuse i think she be better called a survivor that is just an example of using gender sensitive language and rita gave so many examples where we unknowingly uh, categorize or uh, sort of uh, uh, they mean uh, certain uh, some sexes so that we have to keep in mind and with that thought uh, i say goodbye we meet again tomorrow for the last session of the training and tomorrow session will begin uh, at 11 am bangkok time and end at 12:30 pm bangkok time the zoom link to join remains the same so please be there tomorrow goodbye till then so so baji Yes. Yes, uh, Kalpana. Yeah, may, may I request all of you uh, uh, to video on. I want to take one picture. Okay. So there's a request <laughs> from Kalpana. Please switch on your uh, be on the video. So uh, yes. Yes, and send us to us, Kalpana. Yes. Hi, Rita. How are you? Hi, Tin. Hi, <laughs> Happy to see you all. So, is the photo there now? Okay, just a minute. This is for the news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, done. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank, you so you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for thinking. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Bobby. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.